Good morning, everybody. On behalf of the Egmont Institute, the European Policy Center, and the Institut Jacques Delors, let me welcome you to this webinar dedicated to the new Pact on Migration and Asylum. At a time of growing webinars fatigue, this is one of the most successful events we've organized these last months. Even if immigration goes down in the list of matters of concern for the public opinion, as illustrated by recent Eurobarometers, the wide virtual audience attending this morning's event illustrates kind of an understanding that what is at stake is part and parcel of the future of Europe. This is all the more a reason to thank very warmly our panelists for having found the time to join us, notwithstanding an utterly busy agenda in between a council and a European Council meeting, and in the middle of an internal parliamentary process covering in one go a series of politically sensitive and technically complex proposals. Commissioner, Minister, distinguished member of the European Parliament, there is a huge appetite to better understand where we stand, and your presence this morning is all the more appreciated. The purpose of our conversation is to take a step back and to look at the big picture. The pact was presented almost one year ago and was dealt with under two presidencies. Both of them released Andover reports illustrating in a very honest way the obstacles still to be surmounted. And some concluded that this will lead nowhere. On one end, nowhere is not an option, as migration is there to stay and will indeed be shaping the future of our continent. On the other end, by focusing rightly on issues and divergences, one tends to forget that the EU decision-making process keeps on delivering. The upgrade of the visa information system and the new migration financial framework were adopted under German presidency. The Portuguese presidency booked a remarkable success on the blue card, and there are rumors that more could come. And the commission has kept on working around the clock, delivering in, on all the initiatives announced in the pact and proposing updated strategies on integration and inclusion, fight against smuggling and trafficking, or return, for instance. However, major pieces of the jigsaw are still missing. There is no such thing, such thing as a crisis management mechanism in place at a time pressure is mounting again on some points of Europe, southern and eastern flanks, even if numbers still remain relatively low. There is no common vision, let alone understanding, on the way to approach migration as an unavoidable consequence of demographic unbalances, growing post-COVID economic and social inequalities, not to mention climate change. Beacons of instability subsist at Europe doorsteps, and we know that doorsteps can be, in, can be at some distance in a globalized world, from Lebanon to Sahel and Afghanistan. Last but not least, the jury is still out concerning the future of Schengen, to put it mildly, the possibility to move freely, in, to put it in simple terms, I'm sorry, the possibility to move freely in an area of freedom, security, and justice, a challenge on which the Commission has recently showed its card. So this is what we would like to be on our menu today. As usual, a few housekeeping remarks, uh, interventions, uh, of our panelists will be followed by comments and questions of our partners, Jérôme Vignon for the Institute Jacques Delors and Alberto Horst Neidhardt from the European Policy Center. We shall then open the floor for the questions, for questions and answer. Please use the Q&A facility, uh, which is offered by the, by the Zoom platform to that end, and be as concise as possible, so that as a moderator, I could more easily understand what is at stake and possibly bundle questions. Commissioner, 
With the new pact, the Commission, I quote, took a realistic and pragmatic approach aimed at rebuilding trust between member states, strengthening Europe's resilience to crisis and achieve a human approach to migration and asylum. You are the archi architect of the pact. What is your assessment after one year, almost one year, of where we stand and what the next steps could be? Commissioner, the floor is yours. And again, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for, for having me. <clears throat> I think uh, the most important uh, to, to understand where we are, we have to start with, uh, with the reality, not with the politics. So uh, the reality, I, I would like to, to recall again, that very big part of migration in work is working quite well in the European Union. Migration is something normal. 35 million of our citizens are born outside the European Union. Every year, around 600,000 people become EU citizens. Uh, a normal year, we have around 3 million uh, residence permit being issued in the European Union. Most of them because people fall in love with EU citizens or to work here or to study or do, do research, and some of them for international protection. And every year, around 1.5 million people leave the European Union. So we are growing. That works quite well. We are also dealing with a lot of asylum applications. Uh, in a normal year, uh, like 2019, we had 140,000 irregular arrivals. That was we discussed very much. At the same time, we have 600,000 coming visa-free or on visas to the European Union to apply for asylum. So that's a much bigger proportion of the asylum applicants that are coming not irregularly, but uh, overstayers or using the visa-free traveling to, uh, to apply for asylum. In a normal year, uh, like 2019, when we had 140,000 irregular arrivals, we also had almost 400,000 secondary movements. What happened with the pandemic? That reduced those that came on flights, uh, visa-free or on visas to the European Union. So we only had around 400,000 asylum applications from people arriving on planes. Uh, the irregular arrival was almost the same number, but we, we could see a little bit change in the routes. Fewer coming to uh, Greece, uh, more people coming to Italy, more people, a significant uh, increase in people coming on the Western Atlantic route to the Canary Island. There was a raise with 900%. And we have sent fewer uh, uh, secondary movements, around 300,000 or less than 300,000 secondary movements. So it's important to say that this is going on in the European Union and many of those parties working, if not perfect, we are managing. But what we need to address in the pact is those parts that are not, that not works well. And that's what we tried to do in, in the pact that I presented in September. And just to repeat that again, we need to address the irregular arrivals. This is really an, um, an area of concern for countries where the irregular arrivals um, arrive. And this is, of course, a, a concern for everybody because a lot of people risk their lives. And a lot of lives are actually being lost. People die on their way on irregular to the European Union. And the smugglers and the organized criminal groups are earning a lot of money that makes them stronger and they infiltrate the economy. Second, we need to protect individuals better, protect vulnerables and protect fundamental rights and the right to apply for asylum and make sure that those arriving, even those that arrive irregularly, have the right to apply for asylum and are not being beaten up or tr uh, treated improperly. Third, those that have applied for asylum and got a return decision, they have to return to their country of origin. And we are not performing well as European Union there. A normal year, around one third uh, of those with a return decision are actually returning. Last year, even fewer due to the pandemic. And there are quite a lot of people that got a return decision. Around half a million people every year got a return decision and they're not being returned many of those. And that means that they are staying um, irregularly in, in, in a member state. And that means that undermining the, the public trust in the asylum system. Fourth, 
solidarity. Different member states are facing different part of challenges, different kind of challenges uh, when it comes to migration. And this is not equally distributed through member states. All member states need to deal with migration in their own way. But we need also a mandatory solidarity mechanism to make sure that no member states are left alone when they are under pressure and that we are lacking. Fifth, we need more legal pathways. If we would like to have fewer irregular arrivals, we have to invest in, in legal pathways, both for refugees to step up on resettlement and for uh, labor migration uh, or some other kind of, of legal pathways. And the last one, integration. Those that have the right to stay in the European Union have to be part of our society. They have to know you're welcome. We would like to be to have you here. We would like your, your children to succeed in school. We would like you to have a job, earn your own money, being part of our society, forming our society together for the future. So these are the challenges that I'm uh, addressing in the Pact on Migration and Asylum. Other parts are working more or less uh, already. What's important to reach this is First, of course, the partnership with third countries. We can't do it without partnership with third countries. I don't want to build a fortress Europe. We can't just focus on our own external borders. We have to work together with partner countries and along the routes to help partner countries to manage migration, to address the root causes uh, of, of irregular migration, but also to invest in legal pathways, to work together to fight the smugglers, and of course, to make sure that they take back their own citizens and to understand that many of our partner countries are both countries of origin, countries of transit and countries of destination. The other thing that is important is uh, this is a compromise. It has to be a compromise. And uh, you said uh, in the beginning that, uh, and I hear that very often, it's gonna be very difficult to find a common approach from all member states and, and from the European Parliament. And, and of course, I don't think we're gonna have a common view actually, but we can have a compromise that everybody can, can live with. And I think this, this is important. And I listened very carefully to Filippo Grandi uh, when he recently said, uh, I quote now, the pact is no silver bullet, bullet, but we must not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And he called on everyone to accept it, this compromise. The price of compromise is much lower than the cost of, co of not coming to an agreement. And I think this is important. I think we should not be, to be realistic, we can't convince everybody that everything is perfect uh, in the past, but we can convince that we need a compromise to manage migra migration better together and together with our partner countries. Uh, you also asked me to say a few words on Schengen. And Schengen has been under severe challenge since 2015. And we have seen a lot of internal border checks being raised. Both are already for the case of, of secondary movements for threats, security threats, terrorist threats, and now recently for the pandemic. I'm very afraid of a situation where we deal with challenges by introducing more and more internal border checks. That's not the way to deal with these challenges. So for example, these challenges, they are real. We have to address them. The terrorist threat is real. Security threat is real. Pandemic is real. The secondary movements um, threat is real. We have to address them. But the way to do it, for example, for secondary movement, uh, to address that is through the pact and not through internal border checks in, the, in Schengen. Or for example, to deal with terrorist threat or other security threats, it's through police cooperation and new technology and not through uh, internal border checks. So I think it's important to say that uh, these challenges that Schengen is facing, they are real, they have to be addressed. You cannot just look at, a, at another angle, but the way to address them is not really into the Schengen's key, but in other areas. You asked about the progress, uh, um, and I must say that we are making progress, and I think we have to be realistic on how quick this can be done. Uh, and I, I do think that my friend Eduardo Cabrita will, will join me in this, that we had our first uh, uh, physical JHA council meeting uh, last week uh, when we met for the first time physically after presenting the pact in, 
in September. And it was a council with a very positive and constructive atmosphere. Uh, member states and ministers really searching for common uh, ways forward. It's not going to be easy, but nobody really thought it's going to be easy. But I think the most important is that nothing is blocked. Everything is being uh, seen in a, in a positive approach. There are coming new proposals uh, and being prepared that are going to be, of course, uh, negotiating. And I said when I presented the pact that the most important is to rebuild trust. We are rebuilding trust. And one of the most important parts to do that is the progress we have made when it comes to the external dimension. I've been traveling a lot uh, after we're presenting the pack. In fact, I've been in Tunisia twice, and we've seen the result that Tunisia now are intercepting four times more of irregular departures. They are taking back more of their citizens. I've been to Morocco, I've been to Turkey twice, I've been to Mauritania, I've been to Bosnia-Herzegovina, to Albania, I'm going to Serbia on Thursday, I've been to Libya, where it now is a window of opportunity with the new uh, temporary um, government and the, the process leading to, to the elections in, in Libya. So there are ways to work much closer with our partner countries and to reach more um, uh, results uh, in that, and that's a, a good base also for uh, the pro for the compromise on the internal. But as many ministers said in the uh, council we had last week, uh, progress on the external side will not compensate for lack of progress on the internal. So we have to do both, and we are doing both. So as you already mentioned, the blue card was uh, accepted, has been blocked for several years, and now it's adopted. We are very close to the adoption of the EU asylum agency. I do hope that will be possible to reach before the end of the Portuguese presidency. We have been uh, making a lot of uh, uh, progress on the technical level. Uh, we are... Um, uh, we are making progress, especially when it comes to the Eurodac regulation and the screening proposal. And both these two proposals are very important for the integrity of Schengen. And I started to mention to you some of the figures. How are people, migrants moving in the European Union? And to be honest, we don't know for sure because we don't have the registration in the Eurodac in a proper way. So I hope that could be adopted pretty soon. And then also the screening process to make sure that we can find vulnerables. No children should go, go missing, but also that we know who are actually entering uh, European Union and who are not. It's also important that we are stepping up now on the legal pathways. I had I launched a talent partnership last Friday. And that was a very uh, successful uh, conference with a lot of min ministers and high level participants that really embraced this new approach that we are using uh, legal pathways as part of a comprehensive migration management approach with our partner countries. Uh, I will invite for um, a new um, uh, resettlement um, uh, conference uh, in, in July. Yeah. I have to check here. Uh, and I also think that it's time now for the EU resettlement framework regulation to be adopted by the co-legislators. So we are making progress. And of course, one of the most difficult areas is the balance between responsibility and solidarity. But I think that the Portuguese presidency who put forward uh, a discussion paper in the beginning of, of your presidency, Eduardo, where you open up for some of the sensitive issues, like for example, the, uh, for the border procedures, uh, you open up a new discussion paper for a solidarity mechanism also for border procedures to not make too heavy burden on countries of first entry. I think that's an interesting way to explore. Another way you open up for the mandatory solidarity mechanism to have more part of it than uh, relocation and, and return sponsorship or to be other ways that are substantially giving solidarity to a, a member state under pressure. And I think that this uh, way of exploring uh, where it is possible to find a balance that can be accepted by a huge majority of, of member states and parliament is an, is an important way to move forward. And I'm looking forward now when we can uh, meet to 
in, in real life. And I'm already starting to have uh, many bilateral meetings with ministers again to explore where we can find a way forward. Last but not least, I think uh, to conclude this, I think it's very important to not go into the trap of dramatizing uh, the pact or the migration. We are not in a crisis in European Union. Some migrants are in crisis, but European Union is not in a crisis. Member states are not in a crisis. We should really try to avoid having a crisis mode when we discuss this. Migration is a normal phenomenon. And even if we do not always agree, we can find a compromise that will make things work much better. And I think that this sober approach is really important and really trying not to dramatize. There are always um, forces, uh, I should say, especially from the extreme uh, right that would like to dramatize migration, try to threatening by saying now all migrants are coming and we can't manage this and it's gonna be uh, changing our societies and all that. That is not true. We can manage migration. This is not rocket science. Actually, we are managing many parts of migration quite well already, but there are parts we are not managing well enough. That's where we need to make steps forward. And I'm sure that we're going to make it. And I think uh, my conclusion is it's very important to keep calm and carry on. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very warmly for this very comprehensive approach and also this very uh, positive conclusion, optimistic, but reminding us that what we need, I quote you, is definitely to stick to a sober approach, uh, de-dramatizing what is at stake and the issues still ahead of us. Uh, Minister Cabrita, the goal of the Portuguese presidency was to reach a technical agreement on key reforms of the common European asylum system and advance EU's priorities on the external dimension. EU countries have now mostly declared that the new pact proposals are a good starting point, but also called for further changes. You are nearly there after six months of untiring efforts, uh, instead of an assessment of what you have achieved or not, my question would be, what would be your advice to your successor? I mean, after all, I mean, the Slovenian coming after you will complete the trial presidency, uh, uh, which was inaugurated by Germany. And we have also to bear in mind, it was stated uh, by uh, Commissioner Johansson, uh, that uh, you were deprived, as well as the German presidency, for, from the crucial possibility to hold meetings in person, which is a little bit like uh, playing the Roland Garros uh, tennis final, grand final, with a harm tied in the back. So, I mean, you have now your two arms for the last months of your presidency. Your successor will have its two, two arms. How do you see the future shape of things within the council? Minister, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for your invitation and uh, thank you to the Egmont Institute for the opportunity to discuss these important issues which are in the core of the discussion of the European values. Migration is, that is the most fundamental approach we should adopt. Migration is something normal in the history of civilization. It's something what is in the, in, the, in the core of European history. European history is made of uh, uh, hundreds, I would say thousands of years of different migrations. And in the last 500 years, Europeans uh, migrated all around the world. I would say as a Portuguese, there are uh, uh, Portuguese all around the world. That's our history. We understand what is this mood for this tradition for migration, but now we are in a different position all around Europe and also in my own country. What we see, Europe is aging. We are, we are the oldest continent in the world and we are uh, closer nearby the youngest continent with, which is Africa. And that's why we should look on the long term. On the long term, migration should have 
a positive impact on Europe. We should manage, we should address, we should address this issue and not look at it as a threat, as a, a, a tragedy, as a crisis approach. Europe cannot, cannot uh, be again in a situation like uh, we were in 2015 when we had uh, due, during, due to the uh, instability in uh, Syria and the other countries, we had a critical situation in when Europe was not prepared. Situation now is completely different. As Ilva Johansson said, the, 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 we are in a very low trend compared with last years, and we should assume that we should look for migration on short time on a common European problem in the medium and long term as something we, sh we should prepare and we should manage. The pact on exile on migration, which was presented by the Commission in September last year, is a, a, a very important piece, a, a, a complex of several pieces of legislation, but much more than that is a global approach that tries to work for a compromise with all European, with all European member states. We should be clear, we understand that is one of the most divisive issues at European level. That's why two groups of member states said uh, from the beginning in, in, uh, in the German presidency yet that uh, there are uh, different positions on the commission proposal and they would propose what they call a package approach. That would mean they would agree with some pieces of legislation, with some proposals, but, but uh, Met five countries, and in the other side, what we call to, to facilitate it, the Visegrad group countries said we only uh, would agree on a, a, a formal agreement, on a global agreement, if you have it at all. We are not going to discuss uh, separately the different, uh, different aspects of uh, this, this, this discussion. What was the approach of the Portuguese presidency? We said we should support all the technical work. And even with the difficulties of the pandemic situation, most of them through video conference, we had significant developments on all technical issues. And now almost all pieces of legislation proposed by the commission have already a full reading and there, were, there are identified already where are not only member states positions, but what are, where are the difficulties we should tackle ahead. And we selected, we said that in January, in our uh, first uh, council, we said that the political level we should concentrate on three major, three major issues. We should uh, concentrate uh, uh, on uh, the external dimension of migration, on the uh, responsibility for the common management of uh, uh, our European common borders, and we should concentrate on the discussion on solidarity among member states in the management on, of migratory, migratory uh, flows. What we have since then, I think, is uh, significant de developments in the first area, in the area of a common approach to the external dimension and to the relation with our neighbors, uh, especially in Africa, and we have significant developments on the areas of uh, uh, 
risks, responsibility, and in the areas of solidarity. And we should now, we are now in the condition to have significant developments uh, on the balance between these two approach, which are solidarity and the responsibility, which are not at any means contradictory. They're two parts of the same, of the same reality of the same problems. When you look to the external dimension, we have, I would say, two major initiatives. First, uh, for the first time in uh, uh, several years, we had a Jumbo meeting uh, on March, uh, joining uh, the Commission and, uh, um, and uh, all the 54 foreign affairs and home affairs ministers discussing this global external approach. And we should discuss it on a global view. We should propose to our neighbor countries, especially in Africa, which is our closer neighbor, we should discuss the propose global partnerships, considering that the African countries are in all of them, countries of origin, countries of transit, and also sometimes countries of final distance of uh, migrants. That's why we should discuss their cooperation on uh, legal migration, cooperation with them on avoiding irregular migration, and how to fight against uh, smuggling, how to fight against trafficking of human beings, how to work with them on the management of migratory flows, and also link the approach on the management of visas with the cooperation on returns and readmissions. And finally, and that is for us a very important address, because that is linked with long-term approach, we should also join the, dis the discussions on migration with, this, with the work on cooperation for development. The new uh, financial framework uh, allocates 10% of uh, uh, development uh, funds to the migration area. That means when we are investing on, on education for young girls in, uh, uh, in uh, Africa, in countries like Niger, which has the highest fertility rate in the world, we are looking to control not only not only growth in population, but also to allow to control to control on medium and long term uh, uh, levels of uh, of uh, the migratory flows. When we invest on health, when we when we support uh, uh, neighbor countries on vaccination, we are also. Uh, uh, working on the stability of these countries. And their stability is fundamental, not only for them, but also for Europe. And that is this global approach had a rich, uh, strong consensus. And that uh, allowed us to held in May a conference uh, on the management of migratory flows with, with uh, all, all North Africa and Western African countries from Egypt to Senegal. All of them were in this meeting. It, and for what was important, that was the first meeting we had some of them, some of the European and also some of the African ministers in face-to-face -face and not with this difficulty to discuss, uh, to discuss uh, difficult issues on, uh, by video conference. We had the Tunisian prime minister, we had in presence, we had the, the Algerian uh, Home Affairs Minister, we had the Niger uh, ministers in presence and all the others, all the others uh, in, uh, in the video conference. And that means we agreed on a discussion that is a discussion on development, a discussion on legal pathways, a discussion of uh, uh, control of uh, irregular and migration, and also a discussion of e on integration in Europe, and also on integration on uh, 
on the origin countries in case of recovery. We work very close with the IOM and with UN and HCI. We had them in Lisbon in, the, in, the, in this conference, and we had them as our guests last week, also in the last council uh, under the Portuguese presidency. We had uh, Antonio Vitorino with us, uh, and uh, we had previously Filippo Grande or Gillian Triggs, the deputy, deputy uh, uh, I, uh, I, I commissioner. On, and we reach significant developments in this area. We have a breakthrough on the um, blue, card, uh, blue card directive, and I hope we may have in the last, in the last weeks of the Portuguese presidencies a significant breakthrough on the uh, European uh, asylum uh, agency regulation. We reach uh, an agreement uh, on that uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the MED5 countries, which is important because it says that we are not deadlocked in this global, global package approach. We should, especially in this area, area of uh, legal migration, which is the answer, the answer to that it has the, the strong uh, arm uh, 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 weapons we should have to fight against irregular migration, we are facing significant uh, developments. On the balance of, of solidarity and uh, solidarity and responsibility, I think also we have important uh, approaches. One, that the idea that uh, the screening and control of borders is not a problem of only some countries. Geopolitical issues may change what is the, the short-term approach in a, very, in, a, in a very quick way. Control of external borders is not a problem of, for Greece, in the, their highlands, Italy in Lampedusa, or like, as, as this happened last year, a, a Spanish problem on, on, on Canary Islands. As we can say, uh, we, are, can see, uh, we are seeing already, we are now facing problems in Lithuania, due to the stability political situation in Belarus. And we can, uh, I always told that to Hungary or to Poland, it may happen, we don't want it, but it may happen at uh, any time uh, if uh, in their uh, border, uh, European borders with uh, Ukraine. That's why when we are discussing this uh, control of common borders, we should reinforce uh, the adoption with full respect for fundamental rights. And by European legislation, we should uh, adopt the, uh, the uh, European Coast, uh, Coast Guard uh, uh, regulation. The new mandate of Frontex is important in this area, also as having Frontex working not only in Mediterranean areas, but also in Western Balkans. And finally, we should look to solidarity as uh, something that should be mandatory. But uh, we admit that it is a progress we reach with this, uh, some Central European countries. We should look to solidarity on a flex, as a, a flexible approach. That means we should, we should have a crisis management mechanism that should be adopted. We cannot want, wait for the uh, next crisis situation to adopt it. And uh, uh, I'm not going to make any speculation on what's going to happen after COVID. That would be uh, completely useless, but uh, you, we should have a crisis management uh, mechanism uh, 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 applied to all European, to all, uh, to all member states. And in the other hand, we should have permanent, permanent uh, solutions for, for, for uh, adoption of uh, solidarity uh, uh, mechanisms that can be exercised on, uh, uh, with flexibility, adopted by, adopted by the, the countries uh, according 
to their uh, own situation. That should that that's why we proposed what we call a catalog of uh, the ways to show solidarity that may go uh, beyond only the resettlement of uh, uh, refugees or migrants. I think we made a significant progress even in this pandemic situation. Of course, the face-to-face -face, uh, relation, especially discussing uh, uh, difficult issues, is very important. But what we have now is a, a, a room for uh, important steps ahead. I hope Slovenian presidency will, will develop. And certainly, uh, uh, with our responsibilities as a trio members, we should go working closely with the Commissioner Ivo Ivaiola Hansen and with all commission on this uh, uh, area. Portugal, as in this, uh, in this area, has a uh, very special approach. We are the country of Secretary General Antonio Guterres or Director General Antonio Vitorin in IOM. And we understand, as a country of migrants, we understand well why, how we should address in a positive way the impact on the economy, the impact on the uh, uh, European social context of migrants, and why we should work hardly on uh, uh, legal pathways, on integration, and looking not only on uh, this week uh, lives we have to save and to rescue, and we should not uh, 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 stop doing that on the Mediterranean, but where we want to be in Europe in 10, 20, or 30 years. That's on this long-term approach. We should work without delay any day now and the last 15 days of the Portuguese presidency. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Minister, and really good luck for these last uh, 15 days. The last mile is always the most crucial to run, all the more than you, you have a, still a European Council ahead of you, uh, which has seemingly decided to have migration-related discussions uh, during the two days they will meet in person. And clearly, your positive message reinforced uh, the, the, the advocacy uh, of uh, Commissioner Johansson for, I mean, uh, a, a, a sober, uh, I, re I repeat a uh, word, sober approach. Also illustrated very clearly that it is now crucial to restore a kind of a a kind of a yes we can feeling amongst member states so that it could also consolidate the EU in its relation with third countries. Let me now since the outset of the crisis in 2015 the European Parliament has been calling for an ambitious and forward-looking reform agenda of the EU migration and asylum policy. Following the adoption of the new pact the members of the European Parliament the dialogue with the Council and the Commission will result in effective and long-awaited changes in uh, key areas. The European Parliament has engaged in an in-depth preparation process for this dialogue. This will include not only possibly difficult negotiations, but also impact assessment, uh, which the European Parliament has decided to perform, as they were de deemed to be missing uh, as an essential backing of Commission's proposals. What is therefore the state of play of the preparation process inside the European Parliament, and how and when do you see that uh, the institution you are part of will now actually engage into this negotiation uh, with the Council and with the backing of the Commission? Ms. Jancheva, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. De Bruyere, and good morning to all the speakers and participants to today's conference. It's a privilege for me to join the debate today and to contribute to the new European migration and asylum policy. I want to welcome the new proposals presented by the Commission. They created a new impetus in the work of the institution and brought back the topic of asylum and migration at the top of the agendas. And this is exactly the way the asylum policy should be treated. 
is a top priority, is an urgent matter on which uh, we need to deliver as soon as possible. However, it's important that the reform is effective and forward looking. It's not about introducing some changes in current legislation just for the sake of the compromise. What is more important is to guarantee that we will design a future oriented, predictable and well functioning system. And moreover, when doing this, we should not forget the lessons learned during the 2015 uh, crisis. And we, we started this reform because the current system failed several times since 2015. And the system failed during the pressure uh, on the central Mediterranean. And then it failed even more dramatically with the influx in the East Mediterranean. And later it failed also when the numbers went up on the Western Mediterranean. And the common denomination of uh, these three examples is uh, only one. Uh, the current legislation doesn't provide sufficient and systematic support to the frontline member states. But let me be more concrete. What does, uh, what does sufficient support mean? It means that the support will be received on time and, what it will, and, and also it will meet the needs of the member states under pressure. And this uh, uh, inevitably brings us to the question of relocation. I know that this question caused many political tensions, but let's be pragmatic. Relocation might not be the silver bullet to the European asylum policy, but it is the only meaningful solidarity measures that provides real support to the member states under pressure. And relocation might, might uh, not be perfect, yes, but I haven't heard so far someone to have invented an alternative a solidarity measure that had similar effect uh, for the frontline member states. Uh, and this is under my uh, understanding the spirit and meaning of Article 80 of the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, therefore, uh, no matter how difficult difficult will be, we need to find a way to give a central place of the relocation in the, in the new reform. Because as politicians, we have not been elected to take easy decisions, uh, but to take the, the right ones. And in light of this, I do believe that together, the Council, the Parliament and the Commission, we can find a way to enhance the relocation is a critical element for a successful reform. And because let's check the facts. We all know those facts, but let, uh, let's just remember them. Five, six member states are de facto responsible for more than 80% of the applications. Five, six member states out of 27. And not even commenting whether this is fair or it's not fair. I'm only pointing out to the fact that this is not sustainable. And sometimes it's not even manageable, no matter how prepared the national authorities might be. And last but not least, let's not forget, uh, we talk about managing arrivals of human beings, most of them fleeing wars, victims of crimes, unaccompanied uh, minors, and these people don't uh, represent a threat by a definition. And uh, while the security, of course, is very important, it cannot become as a central milestone of the reform. We need fast and effective procedures. Uh, we need predictable rules that are easy to implement on the ground. And as I said, we need uh, meaningful and strong solidarity. Uh, if you ignore the lessons from the past, if you don't use them for the basis of the future reform, we will fail. And uh, we will fail not only uh, in the negotiations, uh, I believe uh, we will fail in the implementation because we don't need a reform that is just acceptable for everyone, but we need a reform that will make difference on the ground. And the biggest difference on the ground, it's called solidarity solidarity with the frontline member states, but also solidarity with those in, uh, in need of, uh, of protection. And while uh, we should use the lessons 
learned so far, we need to avoid the mistakes of the past. This brings me to the question of the external dimension of the migration policy. It's good to have strong external dimension. It's good to constantly upgrade and develop the instruments that we have in this field. But no matter how strong and effective it is, we, the external dimension cannot replace the need for coherent internal rules. And then it's also important how you use the external dimension as a tool for strengthening the cooperation with our neighbors region or as an instrument for outsourcing our challenges to third countries. And when uh, talking about external dimension, many people tend to end up talking about the return, red mission or using trade uh, policy. Now, when the blue card was agreed, we all have seen that making legal migration opportunities fair and possible. Legal migration is a win-win scenario and we should invest more in this field. I hope that the commission uh, we propose uh, new we, we propose new legacy proposal in this field and that they will be as ambitious uh, as possible. And I also hope the question of resettlement will be solved because we talk about fresh start and fresh ideas on asylum and migration. And the proposal for the union resettlement regulation was one of the freshest things put forward. And I think we need to, priority, uh, to put uh, this as a priority. And let me add some words on the European uh, Union Asylum Agency regulation in my capacity as a reporter in this uh, particular file. The upgrade of EASO mandate is without alternative. EASO needs to be a fully fledged agency. Over the last five years, all other European agencies in the field of justice and home affairs have been upgraded uh, and uh, to match the new realities, the new challenges and evolving threats, uh, Frontex, uh, Europol, Eurojust, uh, Eurolisa, all of uh, their mandates uh, have been enhanced. And some of them even more than once. Yes, it was established, uh, you know, more than 10 years ago as a support service, not even as an agency. And after 2015, we demanded them to increase their support, to be present on the spot everywhere they needed, to give more anal analytical and operational products, to work faster and in a more official way. And then uh, struggling, uh, you know, they're struggling every day to meet those new expectations. And uh, they're doing this among the tiny mandate of uh, ordinary European uh, Union service. And this, this is uh, not at all sustainable. The first step toward a fresh start is to turn EASO into a fully fledged agency. And we need to be very pragmatic and very result oriented when, when doing this. The European Parliament uh, has always advocated for a strong asylum agency, and we will continue to work in this direction. We made huge progress under the German presidency and the Council on the text uh, at expert level, and we stand uh, ready to confirm at the political level under the Portuguese uh, presidency. I can only hope that this will uh, happen soon. And uh, at the end, uh, excuse me to be so long, at the end, let me highlight that the freshest thing that we can do in the field of migration is to start delivering, delivering results. The parliament and my political group stands ready to do it. And I'm confident that together, the three institutions will find the right formula on the new reform. And we owe it to the European citizens and we owe it to all the people kept in limbo or in complicated procedures somewhere in the European territory without knowing what will happen next. So thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your contribution, Ms. Yoncheva, with a series of very clear messages from your side concerning the importance to be attached to solidarity, the importance to deliver on the ground, uh, and to, 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 be, to be very concrete in, in, in responding to the expectations of member states and third countries. Also, that, okay, and this resonates with the message delivered by Minister Cabrita that, I mean, partnership with third countries does not mean uh, exter the externalization of problems that we cannot sort inside the house. And last but not least, of course, I mean your commitment to reach quickly an agreement uh, on the European Asylum uh, Agency, which clearly responds to the priority attached to this file by both the Commission and the Portuguese uh, presidency. Uh, now, let me turn to my uh, two colleagues, uh, Edouard, Al um, Alberto Orsneidhart and Jérôme Vignon. In the meanwhile, I see that the first questions are now being entered in the question and answer box. Please don't wait until the end of the conversation to ask your questions so that we can proceed in a very fluent way uh, afterwards. So, uh, Alberto, uh, you are a senior policy analyst uh, at European Policy Center. The floor is yours. Yeah, good morning. Uh, also, thank you on my behalf and all of the European Policy Center for joining us today. I have a question for Commissioner Johansson and for Minister Cabrita. Um, during the past months, uh, both the Commission and, and the Portuguese presidency have, have devoted themselves to overcome divergences and, and find common ground in order to address uh, those problems and shortcomings that uh, uh, Commissioner Johansson has identified and listed in the opening statements. Commissioner, you also highlighted in the very beginning of your mandate that to, work, to make the European asylum and migration systems sustainable and, and future-proof, it's really necessary to reach the broadest possible consensus across member states and EU institutions. Uh, almost 10 months after uh, the launch of the new pact, there has been some progress on certain files, but the negotiations also remain difficult and slow as you have uh, recently acknowledged. My question is, what is the actual reason why the EU seems to be unable to move forward with these long awaited reforms, to adopt changes and reforms that will address the present challenges and shortcomings? Has it to do with the technicalities, uh, with the specifics and the substance of the reform proposals? Or rather, does it have to do with a lack of trust or insufficient trust among member states and EU institutions? And if so, how do we rebuild trust between member states, the European Parliament and the Commission? Uh, recently, the Belgian State Secretary for Asylum and Migration, Sami Mahdi, provocatively said that if all 27 uh, European leaders were to be locked in a castle for a month, then we would have a migration pact. I believe that this is not an option. <laughs> so what is the solution? Thank you for sharing your insights and thoughts. Well, it's a million dollar question, of course, uh, but I will first turn to Commissioner Johansson and then Minister Cabrita to follow up on your comments. Uh, Commissioner, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, we are not unable to find a compromise. Uh, I think we will do that. Uh, I think we have to be realistic. Uh, we have this now, the, last week was the first time we met physically. And when you have um, ministerial meetings physically, then there are meetings in the margins, people talk to each other, they sit down, uh, they try to, to find uh, ways. Uh, and this is what's necessary to be able to, to, to uh, explore where the common ground is. We have been make, making a lot of progress on technical level, but you can't really uh, expect ministers, you know, on these video conferences, you know, we are in one now and this is a bit, do you hear me? And you don't know who is listening. And, and then they suddenly will turn up with a new position. That's not re really realistic because they all have national uh, opinions to deal with and some of them are uh, they can might have opposition parties that are very vocal and so on so it, it's not so easy so it has to be a little bit more in closed rooms in smaller uh, groups so uh, so I, I i don't i don't agree that we are not at with, that we are able we are not blocked we are not unable to find a compromise yes there's the past 10 uh, months but there's been 10 very strange month, so to say, <laughs> for, for us uh, that usually uh, meet each other. But on, in the meantime, we have made a lot of progress on technical level, and it's a huge package, you know, it's seven legislative proposals, it's 500 uh, pages of legislative text. And so we have gone through all that in, in a very good way. We have made simulations to see, uh, to understand what could happen. So um, 
I, I think uh, I think it's important to, of course, put pressure on on uh, ministers, but not to uh, not to to lose this. Uh, um, this sober approach and, and, and optimistic one, because when we met, there was really a constructive and positive discussion, the first uh, live one we had. So it's gonna take some time this, yes. But I think step by step, we, we will make progress and we will reach a compromise in the end. Thank you. And what you said reminds me of a sentence from Albert Einstein, if my memory is correct, who said once we must make things simple, but not simpler than they are. Uh, Mr. Cabrita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Alberto Orsnaita, for your question. I, say, I think you should put the, 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 this problem in context. This is, as I said, perhaps the most divisive issue at the European level among the clearly different views. We had the five Mediterranean countries with a common position. They, they express it in the, in the German presidency or immediately. And we have the Visegrad and the, some other countries that also expressed their, uh, their uh, departure for positions on the pact uh, also in the uh, in the during the the, the 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 German presidency, and we should understand what we had last year since 2015 uh, on the discussion on this on this matter. What we made, even in this, as uh, Commissioner Uriel once said, uh, is significant developments. We had we achieved things were impossible in the last three years in the last six presidencies on the blue card, even the developments we are very close to reach on EASO regulation. And this idea we should join to discuss not only, not only interior, also with foreign affairs, because this is not only a security issue, is a, a, a global foreign relation issue. And also in the commission we have with us uh, the I representative Josep Borrell uh, and the vice president Margaret Skinners, which were in our uh, in our meetings, we should address this as a, a migration as a part, but a very important part of the trust we should build with our neighbor countries. That means we we are not in the the in the in the same in the same. Uh, the posture position, not at European level, not in the work with the with the, the, the European Parliament, but uh, we are not in the same position in the in, from these groups of mem member states. We have uh, this grad county saying we admit at, at least part of them saying we admit the idea of mandatory solidarity, even. Uh, they say we are going to to uh, uh, to work uh, to show it through flexible ways, and we had last week the support from Mediterranean countries to close in sh very short time the agreement on EASA. Portuguese presidency, as special uh, in these uh, very special circumstances we are living with the restrictions to presidential meetings at a very positive and pragmatic approach. That means we never said we are going to conclude this in our presidency. We said we are going to work with our capacity to, to narrow gaps, to work for uh, 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 keep the, make the, the, the member states go closer. We are, uh, and, and also with our special relationship with African countries, we are going to, go ahead and that's why we had these developments. We have now, I think, this good, uh, good approach on the issue and we should now concentrate in the, uh, now we have already identified all the technical uh, difficulties. We should also concentrate on the narrowing the gaps in the areas of solidarity and responsibility. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Minister. Let me now turn to uh, Jérôme Villon, who is advisor to the Jacques Delors Institute. Jérôme, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning to each of you, uh, dear panelists, and thank you for your already very clear and concrete contributions. Uh, my question is especially turned to you, Mr. Minister, and to you, Ms. Uh, MEP Elena Yoncheva, because it deals uh, with the kind of new governance uh, which is underpinning the new pact as proposed uh, boldly in our views by the Commission. Uh, it was a very innovative, but not very much noticed in the Commission's new package. Uh, uh, to, it, in, it consisted in a new migration and asylum forum, which would, would be chaired by the Commission in order to improve cooperation or coordination across member states for the Im implementation of the various new legislations, notably to organize uh, uh, the solidarity mechanism, to organize the coordination in the, in the crisis mechanism, and to organize also relocation, as very much stressed uh, as it was needed by you, uh, Elena Yoncheva. So uh, on this uh, sort of governance, more centered in the ability of the Commission to uh, coordinate or uh, facilitate more than it is the case today, let's be clear. Uh, it is a question for you, Minister Cabrita. Have informal discussions uh, within the GI Council working groups already touched upon this uh, asylum governance uh, forum? And the question to you, MEP Elena Yoncheva, have MEPs in the Libe Commission already touched upon the, this issue? And what would be your personal view about this uh, forum chaired by the Commission. Thank you very much, Jérôme. I would start with uh, Ms. Yoncheva, uh, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, yes, we're discussing all those topics uh, very uh, actively in the Libre Commission, and the forum is currently discussed at technical level among the rapporteur and uh, his respective uh, shadows. Uh, the work is ongoing and the position is not yet defined. However, from my point of view, I can say that the Parliament stands ready to consider any suggestion that will lead to more effective asylum system and uh, meaningful solidarity in compliance uh, with Article uh, 80 of the Treaty, of course. When it comes to the new structures, including the proposed Asylum and Migration Forum, what's important is that these structures do not complicate additionally the process. This is very important to underline. It's not about the structure per se, it's about how they will function and how they will facilitate the work as a whole, because speak of decision-making matters a lot, of course, but especially during pressure of, uh, of crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister Cabrita, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, to Jerome Pignon, for, for your question. I would like to say this, we should reinforce the institutional framework at the European level. That's why the dialogue we think is so important to adopt in short time new uh, European agency for asylum mandate and the, the regulation that gives the opportunity to to work in the in the in the, the with member states but also to work directly with the countries of origin uh, and the transit of migration and also to have an active uh, uh, Political coordination on, the, on these issues. We has we are also discussing this on the, the idea of a governance for Schengen, but also on migration. In the first, uh, the, in the init initial version of the, the Commission proposals, there was an officer for return to to manage returns. It was a very specific, uh, uh, a very specific situation. Who should have? Adopting the pact is a, 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 a permanent monitoring, political monitoring, uh, uh, monitorization of uh, uh, this uh, this situation. Uh, that means 
political monitorization by the member states and uh, and uh, and uh, a coordination of the as executive dimension by the commission but this is a, 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 a positive and very effective approach on the areas we are still working now and on the internal dimension of the pipe thank you Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, and thank you to both Alberto and Jerome for their intervention. I will now turn to the questions from the audience in the understanding that we have only a maximum of 15 minutes left, which means that we are not going to be able to take all questions. But I find all those already in the question and answer box extremely relevant and extremely interesting. And I would really uh, ask, uh, if at all possible to the members of the panel to look at these questions even one the ones that we are not going to have the time to discuss and maybe provide answers in writing to them uh, i will start with a question uh, put uh, by a friend of ours luca hash uh, who happens to be associated uh, with uh, the jacques delors uh, center the jacques delors foundation uh, institute uh, it is actually two there are two questions but i would mean put them in one single question and they are addressed to you commissioner johansson and it's about the state of play concerning the uh, border procedure and the state of the negotiation. Uh, of course, Commissioner Johansson, you are perfectly aware that many fear uh, that we might end up in a situation where these border procedure would end up being dealt with in closed centers. I mean, uh, looking at what's happening, for instance, in Greece, where all the centers remain closed at the time for the time being. So how do you see this negotiation? We know that they are still at technical stage. It's one of the issues which are not ripe yet for this kind of face-to-face -face political compromise between uh, ministers of leaders. But how do you see that progressing? And how do you see the possibility to prevent uh, the situation where indeed all these uh, procedures would be dealt with in uh, closed centers retention facilities as to, to name them. Please, the floor is yours, Commissioner. Yes, this is a very uh, good question and something that's been discussed uh, pretty much. Uh, we don't want to have uh, closed centers. Let me first say that we're not proposing uh, closed centers. We're not proposing new uh, possibilities for detention. What we are proposing is a quicker procedure and this is, uh, I think, much needed uh, when we have people arriving and today around two thirds of those arriving are not eligible for international protection. And this is actually part of our approach that people not in need, probably not in need of international protection because you have to, of course, to have a fair process for your asylum application. But if you're probably not in need of international protection and come and not belonging to a vulnerable group, then the process of course, should be a fair one and a full one, but it could be possible to make a, a quicker individual decision and then make a return decision. And this is important so that this return decision will come immediately and not come immediately after 12 weeks. Uh, but uh, not uh, the case today is that people are staying in the country for years actually before uh, they have a return decision and then they go for secondary movements or they stay and, and they fall in love and they be part of society and it's very difficult to return. So this is the aim uh, with the new procedure. So it's not to, to have more people detained, it's to have more people in a swifter process. This is the whole idea. But I hear of course the concerns from uh, countries uh, of first entry. If many people arrive at the same time, uh, how many people can we have in a border procedure? So I think this is a relevant uh, thing to discuss. And that's what, what I say in my introduction. I think that where uh, the Portuguese uh, presidents opened up in a discussion paper earlier uh, this year on is it also possibility with some more flexibility, some more, uh, more of solidarity also into the border process, but still keeping this uh, uh, aim of having a swifter process so that we can spend a bit more uh, time for the more complicated uh, applications, but those that, that very obviously, or most of them can have a quick, everybody have the right to have their own uh, application processed. Everybody has the right to have an individual uh, decision. Everybody has the right to appeal, but in many of those cases, this could be done quite quickly because the cases are not so complicated uh, for, for many of those, and then they can have 
a quick return decision. And for me, this is also part of um, fighting the smuggling because the smugglers say to people, give us all your money, go into this dangerous journey because if you manage to set your foot on European soil, you can probably stay even though you have no right for into international protection. And this is also important to break this uh, uh, business model of the, of the smugglers. But I hear the concerns. And of course, that's why we open up that this border procedures not only has to be taking place at borders, they can take place at other uh, areas. So it's not about having big detention center, it's about having quicker process. So for example, what we saw when I took, sorry to answer long here, but when I took office, we had 42,000 migrants on the Greek islands. Totally uh, unacceptable conditions. Today, there are 9,000. Still too many, but uh, we have uh, received a lot. And I would never ever see a lot of people being stuck in that kind of, of centers. You should have the, the right to have a swift process. That's why we said the maximum of 12 weeks. If you can't do it in 12 weeks, you have to let people go to other areas. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Now, the next question would be addressed, I think, to both uh, Ms. Jancheva and Minister Cabrita, and it's about the announced breakthrough concerning the European Asylum Agency. I will try to synthesize the question. On one end, people wonder, OK, are we sure that there is going to be a breakthrough? That is to say, as we sure that at the end, 27 member states will sign up to the compromise that, we, that would allow the asylum border pro, uh, proposal to be taken out of this package approach you were referring to, uh, Mr. Cabrita. And on the other end, I mean, to Ms. Sheva, I would ask as rapporteur on the European border, a, 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 uh, the, the European agency, I'm sorry, certainly, as it was said earlier, nothing is impossible if some compromise is not found. A compromise has been found. Uh, we don't know about what kind of compromise has been found. Do you know what the price has been to pay to reach that compromise? And would the Parliament buy into this agreement? So I would maybe start start with you, uh, Minister Cabrita, concerning your expectation of having the 27 members on board uh, before the uh, end of your uh, term, and then ask you, Ms. Jancheva, about the willingness of the European Parliament, about your guidance as a rapporteur, to embrace uh, that compromise, whatever it is. Minister Cabrita, over to you. Thank you for your question, and I would like to thank you all the all the participants in this uh, webinar for the questions, the important questions they, they, they put in this debate. What I think is what is most important is the political agreement we can show and the idea that uh, we can we may move ahead and uh, in the Council uh, with the Commission and also we can uh, now present this proposal to the, to the, uh, to the European Parliament. What we should have is a clear system to deal with asylum uh, uh, requests and to have a, a way to understand that is not only a, a, a pressure that we are putting on the frontline countries. This is something that is a, a global responsibility. I'm not. Uh, Telling we never did that in the last in these six months. We are not. I'm not going to do this in the last two weeks. We what our strong commitment is to go uh, uh, as far as possible, and we are we worked hard in the last two weeks. We have a, a core repair meeting tomorrow. We have. A, uh, and uh, we think we may uh, go uh, until the end of this month, working very closely with the, the European Parliament, understanding this is an issue where the countries should show their uh, willingness to reach compromise. Compromise not for the present, but for the, a future global ag agreement we should reach as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Over to you, Mr. Yoncheva. Uh, if there is an agreement within the Council between the Member States, uh, how would the Parliament will be willing to engage with them? Because, of course, the next step would be a trilogue. Over to you. 
Uh, so uh, first, uh, regarding the package approach. Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Okay, regarding the compromise, uh, the question, uh, I really remain confident that there will be uh, a breakthrough, a real breakthrough, because the text is already uh, it's ready and we are waiting for, for the council, uh, but the work at technical level should uh, uh, show, uh, is showing a very, uh, very good uh, progress. So a legal solution can be found, and I hope uh, with the minister, uh, we are going to reach uh, a political agreement under their presidency. Thank you very much uh, for this very positive approach. Uh, there is a next question attached to it, and I would direct to Commissioner Johansson. It's about kind of a domino game, which could now be the rule of the game in the negotiation of the pact. So we might have an agreement on the European Asylum Agency. Would the Commission be in favor of, I mean, keep on working that way with a series of mini deals, the one after the other? The Eurodac regulation could follow the agency uh, legal framework, then the resettlement framework, for instance, that's at least what I read in the question that was put to Sylvia Carta. But in a, in, a, in a nutshell, would the Commission be willing and would the Commission encourage a successive presidency to work on that succession on mini deals and which would be your priority order amongst these mini deals? Over to you, Commissioner. I think the answer is both. Um, I said already after we presented the pact and during the German presidency that there are part of the pact <clears throat> that could be agreed already. Uh, and it's not, uh, do not affect uh, really the balance between responsibility and solidarity. And that is the blue card, is the uh, asylum agency, is the Eurodac, is the screening, is the resettlement. Uh, so this will not um, really uh, touch upon the, the balance on, on responsibility and solidarity. So this, uh, I think we should make deals on. On the broader, where we need to take all this into account, because otherwise it's not going to be possible. Uh, it's always also the same. Uh, you, also, you have to eat an elephant bit by bit. <laughs> so uh, that's, I think we have to go through different parts. But uh, I think on the solidarity responsibility balance, uh, at the end of the day, there have to be a, a comprehensive approach uh, on that one. Uh, and that includes also the secondary movements, for example. So, so that is, uh, I think, but, but the, the technique to do it uh, could be uh, by reaching um, preliminary agreements that are not being accepted until uh, the big package. But I think it's good that we do not put everything into the big package because not everything are linked to that in that direction. So that's why I do hope that we will be able to adopt some of, of these uh, very important files that I mentioned. Uh, we literally have four minutes to go, so I will just now take two last questions and that I will address them uh, respectively to you again, Commissioner, and to Ms. Sheva. Uh, the first one is, okay, we could expect it uh, at, the, at this point in time. It's the, the views to be, your views about the new Danish asylum law, uh, which has been recently passed and that allows relocation of asylum seekers outside Europe to have their application assessed there. What are the views of the Commission or Commissioner and what are the views of the European Parliament with regard to that? The second question, Commissioner, is about the talent partnership. You referred to the conference that you successfully conducted last week, but I mean, uh, the person asking the question seems to be well aware of what talent partnership could deliver upon, but finds very few information about what the next steps could be uh, and how the Commission intends to deliver on talent partnership, building upon the outcome of what seems to have been a very successful event. So let's start with the Danish legislation, uh, maybe with uh, you, Commissioner Johansson, and then I would go to to Ms. Jansheva and then come back to you, Commissioner Johansson, on the issue of talent partnership. Over to you, Commissioner. Yes, thank you. I think uh, what the Danish um, government or parliament has uh, uh, proposed and decided on is a real bad idea. Uh, I think it's unrealistic. And in my view, uh, it's a huge question mark whether this comply with the Geneva Convention and the treaty. And at least it does not comply at all with the spirit of the Geneva Convention and the treaty. And it's been heavily criticized by uh, the UN High Representative for um, um, the UNHCR, for example, and I fully agree on, on, on that criticism. I think this is not the right approach. Uh, of course, if any member states would like to open their embassies 
for people to apply for asylum uh, outside Europe, they are they can do that uh, whenever they want. But if a person is uh, in European Union, this person, in my view, has the right to apply for asylum here and has its application process. After that, you can make a decision on returns and, and, and a return for a person um, outside European Union. So uh, for both for um, principal reasons, uh, for policy reasons, and for the for to be I think it's not realistic uh, either. So I think it's it's a really bad idea. Thank you, Commissioner. I mean, typically a very clear answer from your side. Very much appreciated. Uh, Ms. Yoncheva, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I'm following uh, closely the, the situation, of course, and uh, personally, uh, I'm very uh, concerned about the development and I hope the Commission will uh, react uh, in a very quick and very decisive uh, manner. And uh, what I heard from, from the press, it is against the uh, European uh, law. Thank you very much again. Uh, let's look forward for further development. I come back to you, Commissioner, on the question of uh, about the next steps concerning talent partnership. Over to you, Commissioner. Yes, uh, thank you for this question. So talent partnership is about a win-win-win, uh, where uh, young people, or not necessarily young, but people in third countries, partner countries on migration, can come to the European Union to work here uh, and then go back to the country of origin uh, to benefit both the country of origin, the European Union, the member state, and the individual. Why, what is the difference between ordinary labor migration? Because ordinary labor migration can take part and takes part uh, all the time. This is about using a specific, and that's where, where the commission comes in. We are ready to fund, to use expertise, to uh, monitor. So that could be, for example, we have some pilot projects, for example, where people in Nigeria are being educated in ICT. To ICT experts. So we are building up uh, educational training capacities in the partner countries. And then they go and work in Lithuania for a period. And then they gain expertise and a lot of uh, life experience uh, that they feel were very positive. And then after some period in, in Lithuania, they go back to Nigeria. And this is the way to build how we can use this uh, more so that it's more monitored, more organized than ordinary labor migration. So it's not about brain drain. It's not about cherry picking. It's about helping also to build capacity in a country uh, of origin. I visited one of those projects in, in Morocco, for example, where they were also educating people. Both Some of them went to a, a, a company in Belgium to work and others worked in Morocco. Uh, so it's about building capacity, uh, helping the, the country uh, of origin, and that's part of the ma migration management, but also giving legal opportunities for young people to come and get an experience from, from the living European Union, earning some uh, European wages, <laughs> and, and then also go back and building also stronger relations and, and friendship between. And in my view, this is important because when I go to third country and ask them, we would like to work to you to fight the smugglers. We need that you take back all your citizens. We need you to monitor your borders better. We need you to build up your asylum capacity. They also need to say something to their young uh, inhabitants about uh, possibilities also to find a, a brighter future because people would like, of course, to have opportunities. And this is part of that, of that package. And that's why I need the strong support of member states and employers and businesses and, and trade unions to be part of this. And I think also that we could use the diaspora uh, to help also when people come up for language courses, for example, how to integrate. So it's about building stronger relations based on a win-win-win situation and based on working in the European Union, but where we also help doing the education. And it's not only for highly skilled work, it could also be for, uh, for medium and low skilled. We have, for example, another where um, drivers, truck drivers, go to Morocco for a period per year and then go back to Morocco. So they work for some months in Spain 
earning uh, European um, salaries, <laughs> going back to their families for part of the year and then going back again. So this is like also a part of, of circular migration. Uh, could it be on the talent partnership? Thank you very much, Commissioner. And indeed, I mean, it's a very promising approach. And as I'm sure that a certain number of stakeholders, private sector stakeholders at the EU level will be willing to engage in this kind of very promising approach. Now, uh, dear panelists, dear members of the audience, it's time to bring that very interesting webinar to a close. I feel frustrated because there are still a lot of very interesting questions in the Q&A box. Amongst other one of them, uh, I, I cannot refrain to refer to the one put by Alexander Conway about the possibility impact on the new pact uh, of another uh, very uh, difficult issue, which is the Northern Ireland Protocol following the Brexit. And I mean, the, this, uh, what, what will happen at what is going to become uh, also an external border uh, of, the, of the Union in, in migration term. But uh, maybe, uh, dear Commissioner Johansson, Minister Cabrita, and uh, dear Mr. Jancheva, your aides, or you who were so tremendously helpful uh, in uh, helping us to organize this webinar uh, could, could help by providing answers in writing uh, to this question. There was also another one addressed to you, Mr. Mr. Cabrita, asking for more precision about what you intend concerning what you meant by this uh, catalog of flexible uh, forms of solidarity and how you would see that being elaborated. But we unfortunately do not have time to elaborate precisely further on that this morning. I mean, I mean, this webinar definitely, I think I can say it on behalf of the three organizations met our expectation in terms of clarification, in terms of very clear messages, in terms of bringing us back to where we are and understanding clearly what is at stake and what can be expected in the next few months, but what has already been implemented. And therefore, we cannot but repeat our very warm thanks to you, Commissioner Johansson, to you, Mr. Cabrita, and to uh, Minister Cabrita, and to you, uh, Ms. Sheva, for having spared a bit of your time uh, with us uh, this morning. This will have you speak to be will obviously be followed up. Uh, I mean, there is only one off uh, of a series of many events. I can already announce, for instance, from our partners that the European Policy Center will soon host a policy dialogue on EU between EU and US on migration, which is quite a, a timely initiative at this very moment that the United States uh, president is in Brussels and is meeting at this very moment uh, the heads uh, of the uh, EU institution. And there will be further event or back to related event organized in the autumn uh, by the European Policy Center. The L'Institut Jacques Delors will convene in November uh, in Marseille, an event on integration. By the way, I mean, you all entered that the importance of in-person meeting be aware that the, the importance of this kind of meeting is shared by experts, analysts, uh, academics. I mean, we all aim at returning back to seminar, workshop, conferences in person, uh, although we all appreciated the flexibility that webinar do offer, but we also need these kind of personal exchanges which facilitate building and sharing uh, knowledge. As far as Egmont is concerned, we're going to have a, another webinar Monday next week on the 70th anniversary of the Geneva Convention. I mean, uh, there was a quote uh, from Commissioner, uh, fr of Commissioner Grandi, I, Commissioner Grandi, in the presentation of Commissioner Johansson. And we are going to hold early September, 9th and 10th of September, a conference in person in Brussels, and together, also together with the Odysseus Network, where we'll, be, we'll go more in depth about a series of issues that will still be on the table of those ending the negotiation of the pact in the future. That will be a bit of a follow up of the conference that we organize. In Helsinki uh, in 2019. Again, thank you very much for your participation this morning. Thank you very much for your very clear and, uh, I mean, thought provoking uh, contribution. Uh, look forward to meeting you again. And anyway, you can certainly count our, of our support in your endeavor to deliver uh, on this pact. Uh, wish you a very good day. Wish you a very good week. I wish you a very successful end of your presidency, Mr. Mr. Cabrita, with possibly a success on the border. Uh, the border agency and we shall wish all, all of us the best for Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you and have a good day. Bye.